I grow impatient. Don't worry, Illidan. You're going to get in another Deathless video really soon. I sat still for ten thousand years. I believe that is enough. Hey, I'm not that slow at making videos. Didn't you see the sweet blindfolded video I made recently? No, I did not see that. Or anything else for that matter. Right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Giant Crank Games, and we finally made it to the Frozen Throne Deathless. For anybody that's new here, here's a quick refresher on the rules. But first, I have to thank my patrons. With a special thanks to my Colossal and Titan tier patrons, King of Pie, Paint My Eye, Eeyore Lover, and Eclipse 2025. For this video, I'm going to be doing something experimental that I'm a little bit apprehensive about. I'm going to be talking about failed strategies, and I'm going to be showing more clips of failed runs. This means that units are in fact going to die on the screen in runs that I had to reset. I know for a fact this is going to make some people in the YouTube comments very upset, so please be kind when correcting them. With that out of the way, let's jump into it. The Sentinels campaign is the first of Warcraft 3's expansions. As is tradition at the time, this comes with a massive spike in difficulty. Throughout the majority of Warcraft 3 Deathless, the average attack wave tends to not be that difficult. They give me a bit of time to build up and secure my position before I have to engage the hard stuff. From now on, every enemy attack wave is a threat. The previous stumbling points turn into straight up roadblocks. Fortunately, Warcraft 3's no build missions tend to be easier than the rest, and Rise of the Naga is no exception. I'm given Maiev, the Night Elf Warden. Maiev is a fairly frail agility based hero with a high attack damage and some powerful but mana hungry spells. Her first ability is Blink, allowing her to teleport a short distance. Every mission in this campaign is littered with hidden away areas that hold items. In order to make Maiev as powerful as I can, I'm going to be very thorough with my searching. After clearing the enemies a bit, I run into the primary antagonists of the campaign, the Naga. The Naga are absolutely ridiculous. Every unit they have is completely overstated in comparison with the playable factions. The Naga Myrmidon and Royal Guards are as powerful as hero units. The first Naga ambush goes poorly for me. I intended to use Shadow Meld on low HP units while I worked away their forces. What I didn't know is that the Naga Siren Spellcaster has a damage over time ability called Parasite. Once my archers took too much damage, I Shadow Melded and slowly watched them bleed out. Before resetting, I decide to scout the terrain a little bit and find that there's a fountain of healing right after the fight. On my next attempt, I use my Ev to distract the giant Naga force while running my troops towards the fountain. Knowing that I can now pull back my damaged forces to the well allows me to take the fight significantly more easily. Now that the healing well is secure, I don't have to worry about damage between the fights. I can clear the entire map. There are two bonus objectives to do. First, some berserk wildkin are stomping around the south of the map that need to be taken out. After thinking for a minute, I realize that this mission takes place during eternal nighttime, and I could simply shadow meld a couple units to create a force field while my archers finish the job. Next, a group of satyrs have taken some allied forces hostage. Due to rule number two, I have to save them. The satyr boss is pretty tough. He's able to raise his fallen brethren from the dead but I show him that a much better strategy is just not having your units die in the first place. The final portion of the mission involves stopping Illidan from sinking allied ships. Unfortunately, it's impossible to keep all the ships alive as the enemies will completely ignore my forces while targeting them down. On the other hand, a bunch of enemies that are targeting down some pieces of unmanned wood makes a joke of a final fight. The Broken Isles is a great introduction to the insane difficulty spike of the Frozen Throne. The objective is simple enough. I must reach a temple and clear it of defenders. There's a Naga base on the way and a high HP gate that stops me from running past. If this were Reign of Chaos, this would be simple enough, but the Naga do not play by the rules. I spawn on an island. I'm expected to use rickety transport ships to get around. They're weak and have no attacks. Perfect. At the top of the island is Drakthul, a warlock who wants me to destroy three summoning pits on a different island for a reward. Fortunately, Maiev can blink to this island without any issue. The pits put out a large number of enemies, but they're part of three separate factions who are hostile to each other. I kill the pits while the ghost orcs fight each other and am rewarded with a Robe of the Magi plus 6, one of the best spellcaster items in the game. After cleaning up the remainder of the island and building a solid army, I venture onto the high seas with my transports and head towards the enemy base. Meet the Quaddle. It's overpowered. Quaddles are flying Naga units that the AI loves to make a ton of. Being flyers, they stack up on top of each other, allowing them to dish out tons of burst damage to single targets. They also hit for an average of 46 damage. For perspective, the equivalent Night Elf unit, the Hippogriff Archer, averages 17 damage per hit. The only units I can build on this mission for anti-air are Dryads or Archer. Both of these die in a few hits to Quaddle. This caused a ton of resets. Trying to be a bit more tactical, I waited until the Quaddle sent an attack wave towards my base and then landed my forces in a different direction to approach the Naga base from a wider angle. 
Not only did the Naga kill my Dryads, but I lost my main base as well. For my next attempt, I realized that the defending base didn't actually have to be killed. I massed Ancient Protectors at home to hold off the Naga Onslaught, and tried to solo the final defenders with my Ev. After learning there are 8 Naga Myrmidon, each with about twice the HP of my Ev and who deal more damage than she does, I gave up on the idea. There are mercenary frigates that can be purchased from neutral shipyards around the map. They do high damage, and I decided that engaging the Naga in the open ocean might benefit me. However, they're unarmored, so they take extra damage from the Quaddle's piercing attack, and are very unresponsive when commanded. I couldn't save them when they got target fired. At this point, I was getting frustrated. I tried all of my anti-air options, and none of them were viable. I started scouting around the map in desperation for any idea at all. I found a small outcropping of trees above the Naga base. I restarted the mission and put my plan into motion. I made a large army of ballista and transported them onto the top of the map. Ballista can destroy trees, so I used them to punch a hole through the top of the map past the Naga base. Once the ballista are in position, I get vision of the surrounding area with a Huntress's Sentinel ability and blink my Ev into the final arena. My Ev can't fight these Myrmidons alone, but the enemies are melee. I kite groups of them towards the ballista and then blink to safety. My ballista cleave through the Myrmidon uncontested and then my elf blinks back into the action. I rinse and repeat this process until all the defenders are dead, and easy, mission done. The Tomb of Sargeras is another no-build mission, and while it's not particularly difficult, it's one of the most important missions for this campaign and the next. Despite being an agility hero, I've opted to build my elf as a spellcaster for maximum burst damage, giving her multiple intelligence and mana boosting items. The mission once again takes place during the night, meaning that with patience, the early bits are quite easy. Groups of reinforcements provide Druids of the Claw, who have the Rejuvenation ability. It's both a strong mid-combat heal as well as a way to keep my units topped off between fights. Majority of the map is made up of secret areas with items. The most important item is the Shadow Orb that's shattered into 10 different fragments I have to find. I make sure to comb the map for all 10, as the orb gives my have incredible defensive utility, a nice damage boost, and the ability to strike flying targets. Eventually, I start running low on healing, so I use my Ev's spells plus Shadow Mel to take down some of the more threatening enemy groups. After encountering the Naga, things start to get difficult, as always. These Naga packs serve as an introduction to the Bane of the Run, the only unit ever to almost convince me to quit a Deathless Run. Say hello to the Naga Royal Guard. As I continue through this run, these monsters are going to give me a ton of trouble. So, let's go through their abilities. Crushing Wave is a conal area of effect spell that deals 150 damage to up to 6 targets. Resistant Skin gives immunity to many detrimental spells, as well as heavy resistance to all others. They have 1,350 HP and 11 armor, higher than most level 10 heroes in the game. And of course they deal chaos damage, which means that Maiev's armor does not protect her. All of these points alone would have made the unit a great threat, but that's not the worst of it. These guys love to stun. The Frostbolt ability stuns a non-hero unit for 5 seconds on a 9 second cooldown meaning that two royal guards can permanently stun a unit until it dies. And the final ability, Summon Sea Elemental, seems pretty tame, until you realize that each of the elemental's attacks has a 15% chance to stun for two seconds. Naga royal guards are tougher than me, hit harder than me, do massive bursts of area damage, and chain stun my units. All this for a unit that the AI can build out of a normal production structure. Anytime you see a Naga royal guard on this run, Know that I most likely had to reset at least once because of him, probably more. This 8 mission run took longer to complete than the 26 mission Wings of Liberty Deathless, all because of these guys. Fortunately, for the final fight of Segment 1, I gained control of a timed life for Balk Champion to fight. After the fight, all of my units are killed in cinematic, so I figure he's good to use. I don't exactly know why a Furbolg is here, but he was probably the one that killed Sargeras. After the cutscene is an escape sequence. When she's on her own, Maiev is an incredibly maneuverable hero, and I have no problems escaping. Wrath of the Betrayer is a weird mission. On the right side of the map, I have a base, and on the left side, an army. These are two completely isolated groups. Instead of building an army to reinforce, I must hold out against Naga attack waves at my base while moving through a no-build segment on the left. Honestly, it's a really cool mission design, and I wish we saw more of this sort of thing in modern RTS. For a Deathless run, on the other hand, it's a mess. The Naga attack waves start out weak, but ramp up in difficulty over time. I need to finish the mission quickly, otherwise relentless aggression will grind me down. In order to defend, I build a three-tiered defense of Ancient Protectors in the front, Wisps behind to repair, and then some Moonwells behind to heal the Wisps. My Ev's army on the left is small but has some strong healing power. The objective is to bring the runner to the top left corner of the map. 
The runner itself cannot attack, but has the human priest's healing ability to slowly patch up my forces. I also have two druids of the claw, each with the rejuvenation ability. That being said, my backline is made up of vulnerable archers, so I have to be careful still. I send my Ev in first during the fights. Now that she has a shadow orb, my agility-based mage is fairly tanky. What a weird class design. The western path isn't that difficult, but it is long and winding. There are side paths with lootable gold that gets transferred to my eastern base. The gold mine has limited funds, so I grab these to help my defense. After clearing through about half the mission, I encounter my first Naga Royal Guard. I decide to kill him because he's royally guarding some loot. After taking him down, the loot from his group gets stuck in the water on an unpathable location. Thanks, Reforged. After rescuing a boat and some ballistae, my army is looking a bit more formidable. The final stretch involves Tidal Guardians, the Naga's static defense structure. Just like every other Nagi unit, the Tidal Guardian is completely overpowered and has to be destroyed at range with my ballista. Around this time, the attack waves against my base are getting fierce. Dragon Turtles are a crazy powerful siege weapon with great damage resistances, forcing my Wisps to repair protectors during the fight. This enables the Naga Siren Spellcaster to use Parasite on my workers, a damage over time ability that quickly drains my Moonwell's healing energy. After opening up a gate, I find the last boss of the mission, two Naga Royal Guards. I legitimately can't fight this. Instead, I opt to load my runner into her transport, charge my Ev alone towards the guards, and blitz past them at full speed to the objective. And to my surprise, it worked. And then about six hours after the stream ended, I got a DM on Discord from a guy saying he watched the VOD and I lost a unit halfway through the mission and didn't notice because I was building ancient protectors at the time. So I had to do the entire mission again. Fun. Balancing the Scales has a really cool mission design that is frustratingly problematic. Similar to the last mission, I have a base on one side that has to hold off Naga attacks and an army on the other side, this time headed up by Tyrande and Malfurion. Instead of needing to reach an objective point, the army has to clear its way towards my base and then join up with it. There are groups of rescuable allies on the path to bulk up this army as I progress, but there's a problem. After my forces are reunited, I'll be turning my eyes on the Naga base at the top right. The rescued allies take up a lot of supply, and they aren't that great in combat. If I rescue them now, I can't muster an army strong enough to kill purple without losing something. Instead, I build an Ancient of Wonders at Maiev's base. From there, I purchase a Staff of Teleportation for her and move her west, blinking past all the obstacles. After Maiev reaches the army, she can now use the Staff to teleport Malfurion and Tyrande to my base. The rest of the army is going to stay here. The units are too weak and the enemies don't attack over here, so they're safe. Now is the time I should probably admit that this mission is not possible deathless. The beginning cutscene involves Malfurion casting Summon Treants on a patch of woods, giving me some 60 second time duration units. This mission is not possible to beat in under 60 seconds, it's not even close. I tried some various things, such as triggering cutscenes around the time that the Treants would die, but their duration would pause and then they would expire after the cutscene ends. I couldn't figure out a way to stop these mandatory summoned units from dying. It's frustrating, but this is the first time I have to admit that there's a mission that can't be done deathless. Once the heroes are at my base, I move on to the Naga outpost. Malfurion and Tyrande are level 10, and they make quick work of the majority of the defenders. I do have to bait the Royal Guard stuns with my Ev, though. After claiming my new home, I start production. Because the game has forced so many jank units on me, I start at 46 supply, giving me only 54 for more units. In order to maximize my power per supply, I opt for Chimeras, the highest tier Night Elf unit. Its long-ranged firepower is exactly what I need to break into the final base. After maxing out and defending an attack wave, it's my time to strike. So why are Chimeras required to take this base? And why are all the other units suddenly virtually inviable? That's because the enemy now builds royal guards out of its production structures like normal units. That's right. Units as powerful as a level 10 hero are now built out of normal structures. It's absurd. There's a healing well on the northern side of the map. I thought that pulling enemies towards the well and fighting there would be a great way to reduce incoming damage. Boy was I wrong. The Naga Myrmidons have the ensnare ability, bringing my chimeras to the ground and rendering them unable to move. The Quaddles and Royal Guards then chain stun and target fire my chimeras to death, forcing a reset. I tried using Malfurion's Tranquility spell to keep my forces healed, but the royal guards would repeatedly stun him with Frostbolt, interrupting the spell. And the enemy Kawaddles are crazy aggressive. They dive huge distances in order to target fire my weak Chimeras. I hate the Naga. I seriously do. This campaign is driving me crazy. The combination of fragile Night Elf units combined with high damage Naga and a plethora of stuns 
is a frustrating mess. This mission took me over two hours of attempts before I came up with an answer. I attack the southern portion of Illidan's base first, using the Chimera to tactically snipe high-value targets, mainly the Royal Guards, and doing the majority of the fighting with my heroes. Once Illidan counterattacks me, the Chimeras stay at the base to mob the stragglers while the heroes head home. Illidan is really annoying. Just like the Naga he commands, Illidan is completely overstated, and he loves spamming the Mana Burn ability, which really sucks when all of my heroes are optimized towards spellcasting. After Illidan is dead, it's time to shove into his base. I backtrack and rescue all of the allies who have been patiently waiting in their ships for the last two hours, bringing me up to 125 supply. I'm not going to use a majority of these units, but the new Mountain Giant is a great damage sponge. I pull my enemies into a choke point so the Royal Guards can't easily get in range to stun my heroes, then I use Starfall and Tranquility and take the fight. Even with all these factors, the fight is not easy. Both of my Mountain Giants get very low, and I easily could have lost something if the enemy Illidan didn't decide to run past all my forces instead. I got lucky. Once the army is dead, I make sure to target fire the enemy's altar so that Illidan can't be revived, then quickly clean up the remaining structures so they can't rally another force. This mission taxed my patience to the limit. Shards of the Alliance introduces me to Kael'thas Sunstrider, the hero for the next campaign. He's level 2 and will need babysitting. The mission is a simple escort quest. Kale and his convoy move through the map and get attacked by the undead. Some of the undead forces are pretty strong, but there's literally nothing that could intimidate me after fighting all these Naga. For keeping allies alive in this mission, I decided that losing any piece of the caravan or losing Kale himself is a reset. The convoy moves slowly, which is normally pretty annoying, but this means that Tyrande's Starfall is off of cooldown almost every other attack. This makes the waves go much more smoothly. Instead of getting Night Elf units for the mission, I can reinforce with my choice of mercenaries. I opt for the ranged trolls instead of the melee ogres. The ogres hit hard, but are fairly squishy and I don't want to deal with that. To fund these mercenaries, there are caches of gold and lumber behind well-defended undead camps. I don't actually have to kill the defenders to get the money though. My Ev can blink past everything and grab the cache with no problem. In the middle of the map is the first real fight. Undead crypt fiends hit really hard, and banshees give me a 33% mischance. The mountain giants do a great job of providing a front line, and I manage to clean things up. The final stretch is a choice. I can either attack through a heavily fortified undead stronghold with a level 8 lich and a level 3 dreadlord, or not do that. The left path is still pretty well defended, with spirit towers and frost worms, but it's manageable. The mission ends with an undead ambush that fields a large number of units from all sides, but a good starfall cleans them out without much issue. I don't know what the opposite of a difficulty spike is, but this mission was it. It's surprising how easy everything feels after fighting the Naga for so long. Fighting them was like training with weights on. The Ruins of Dalaran is the final mission against the Naga, and it does not let up. I have 30 minutes to kill 4 Naga summoners in the depths of Illidan's fortress. The Naga are relentlessly aggressive from the top side, making it hard to fight without being counterattacked. And to make things worse, there's an undead base with multiple level 10 heroes in the bottom right who are also constantly attacking. To help things out, Kael'thas has joined me as an AI-controlled base. Typical allied saving rules apply. Neither Kael nor his castle are allowed to be taken down. Unfortunately, Kael is a level 2 spellcaster. At this stage of the campaign, a stiff breeze would take him out. There are five entrances to our combined base, making static defense useless. And to nail that point home, the Quaddle often come over the tree line to attack, ignoring the chokes. I start with 47 supply of units, who are almost all too frail to fight. This brings me the same problem I had two missions ago. I'm actively being brought down by my starting forces. I default to Chimera production again. That seems to be the only viable option. My army here will be a little bit stronger this time. In the top right of the map, there's a rescuable paladin named Margoth the Defender, and he is pretty sweet. His devotion aura gives my forces a nice durability boost, Divine Shield keeps him alive, and Holy Light's high single target healing pairs nicely with Tranquility's area healing. After defending an Illidan attack, I move to counter. I target down ground units with my Chimera while the Hippogriffs fight the Quaddle forces. And I get wrecked. Also, Kale dies. I try this Chimera-based army a few more times with different strategies, and each is to no avail. Even a maxed out Chimera force with all three heroes just isn't enough. I move to plan two, assassination. The Naga summoners are in the far back of the enemy base, but Maiev is ridiculously mobile. If I were to use her blink ability to rush all the way to the back and burn all of Maiev's spells on Channeler, and then use Town Portal to escape, I would eventually win, right? No. 
The summoners are immune to physical damage, and despite both of them casting mana, Maev's spells are actually physical attacks. Maev can't hurt these people. I'm starting to get really tilted. These missions are driving me crazy. After exploring the map for a bit, getting stunlocked by royal guards, getting killed by Illidan, trying different unit combinations, getting stunlocked more by royal guards, I get so frustrated that I quit for six months. I got some speedrun world records instead because it was easier. And then one morning, I woke up with a realization. Malfurion is a horrible person. Maybe he would be the better assassin here. So my plan begins. I rush my Ev as fast as possible to the top right to rescue Margoth and then Town Portal home. I hand Malfurion all of my best durability increasing items, grab another Town Portal scroll, and the boys head off. Malfurion leads a charge, absorbing as much of the damage as he can. The Naga have a slow poison that reduces his movement speed, but he perseveres. Margoth drops holy lights on Malfurion to keep him topped off. As Malfurion gets close to the objective, Margoth starts to draw the enemy threat. He can't heal himself, but this is okay. As I reach the channelers, I realize that while they're immune to physical damage, they take drastically increased spell damage. I use Malfurion's Entangling Roots ability on the first channeler. Surprisingly, this deals enough damage to kill her in one shot. I considered town portaling out here. However, in practice, I found that I can't use this attack run four times. Kale will die before I manage to win. I have to take two of them out every time. Margoth uses the Divine Shield ability, giving him temporary immunity to damage. If he's still here when it runs out, he will drop. All of the attackers, including Illidan himself, dive Malfurion. But Margoth gets a clutch heal off just in time. After the cooldown completes on Entangling Roots, Malfurion ensnares a second channeler, and they escape with a scroll of town portal. After doing this attack run twice, I wait at home for the roots to do their damage, and the mission ends in a cool 3 minutes and 54 seconds. Well, 6 months, 3 minutes and 54 seconds, but who's counting? The Brothers Stormrage is an absurd final mission. There are 5 undead bases in the center of the map. These undead are incredibly aggressive towards both of my bases. These bases are split up on the left and right sides of the map, one controlled by Malfurion and the other controlled by Illidan. To win, I have to take out the red base, who is protected by all of the other undead bases and well fortified with powerful heroes and units. Illidan's base is a Naga base. Finally, the tables have turned. Now I can build the powerful Naga Royal- What do you mean I can't build it? Well fine. Well at least I have access to the nimble flyer that has been tormenting me through this run. I build a giant army of Qua- I can't build any of those either. Well then. Uh, at least I have the Naga Siren Spellcaster, who does a powerful damage over time effect with Parasite that summons a timed duration unit when the host dies. Oh. Oh no. While I get to play as the Naga, I don't get any of their fun toys. While Illidan's base is problematic, Malfurion's is a nightmare. A green undead sends air raids against him. They're not that bad to contend with, but they are annoying. The orange base near him, on the other hand, is ridiculous. The attack waves from it are huge and frequent. Managing Illidan's side while keeping Malfurion alive is difficult. In off-stream practice, I attacked the orange base. A maxed out bear army with full upgrades was not enough to take it down without a friendly death. I tried making Illidan an army of dragon turtles, a strong siege unit who can consume enemies. I thought that maybe devouring the red player's army and then blitzing down their structures before they could rebuild would be a good strategy, but the red player was too strong for the frontal assault. Additionally, Malfurion broke under the pressure and died. And double additionally, Illidan's base got broken and died. I can't spend extended periods away from my base, otherwise I die to the counterattacks. After a few tries with different army compositions, I concluded this was not a fight that a well-microed army alone could overcome. I need a precise plan. And more importantly, I need a hero that is significantly more powerful than what I currently have available. After a few hours of practicing off-stream, discussing the map with my friend Frequent, and studying the mission, I came up with a plan to beat the Brother Stormrage without losing unit. 1. As the mission begins, use the nearby shop to buy Illidan a potion of invisibility, and then charge Illidan past the green undead base and head up the river. There's a rock golem here that drops the claws of attack plus 15. Use Illidan's ultimate to defeat it. 2. Uproot Malfurion's Ancient of War and send it to the north of the undead base. Start eating the nearby trees. 3. Start producing upgraded Druids of the Claw for Malfurion. These are the only units strong enough to withstand the orange base's assault without a casualty. 4. When attacking Illidan, the undead drop near the shop. Start building towers nearby to defend the location. Pick up another invisibility potion while you're there. 5. The Ancient of War has reached the back of the trees by now. Start eating downwards towards the south. 6. Send Illidan towards the Fountain of Healing in the south. 
There's a damn blocking movement until a troll warlord is killed, which I cannot do yet. Illidan chugs one of the invisibility potions and moves straight through the undead base to reach the fountain. 7. There are a bunch of Sasquatch near the fountain. Kill them, but be careful only to pull a few at a time. They can easily overwhelm Illidan even with the fountain's healing. 8. As Malfurion's bear force starts to increase in number, build ancient protectors for fire support and anti-air. Remember to keep building towers at the Naga landing point as well. The undead attack waves are seriously strong. At least 20 towers are needed to survive. 9. Once Illidan has killed the Sasquatch and healed at the fountain, use the invisibility potion to return home, buy another one, and then head up the road to the troll warlord. Illidan can barely solo this warlord with his ultimate and standing in point blank range for immolate damage. This troll drops the Mask of Death, in my opinion, the best item in the game. With the mask equipped, each of Illidan's attacks against non-buildings heals him for 50% of the damage he deals. This is the linchpin for my strategy. The warlord dying also clears the dam from the north to the south. Illidan no longer needs invisibility potions to move around. 10. Take Malfurion to the Ancient of War that's been eating all the trees behind the orange base. Bring Illidan from his side to the bottom of that cliff. There's a very small area where Malfurion can pass items over to Illidan. Give Maiev's Shadow Orb plus 10 and the Mana Stones to Illidan. Drop the Mana Stones on the ground, they're not needed yet. Illidan now has the Shadow Orb plus 10, Claws of Attack plus 15, an Orb that deals bonus damage, a Helm that gives plus 5 to all stats, and the Mask of Death. Altogether, these items double Illidan's attack damage. I didn't mention it at the time, but while I was buying invisibility potions, I was also grabbing potions of invulnerability from the shop and leaving them on the ground. It's time to pick them up. The red base doesn't train workers or rebuild structures, but they will rebuild slain combat units and heroes. Illidan's metamorphosis temporarily gives him chaos damage, meaning he deals full damage to buildings. Instead of fighting the red army, Illidan activates his demon form and burns down a production structure. I focus the altar first so that heroes can't be rebuilt. After that, Illidan can take down the enemy Dreadlord. Once Illidan is fighting units with the Mask of Death, it gives him incredible sustainability. Once Illidan hits low health, use the Potion of Invulnerability to make a clean escape. It's only a 7 second duration, but that makes a fantastic getaway tool. Now that everything is set up, follow a simple rotation. Snipe one of the production buildings of the red base with Metamorphosis. Kill some of the units produced from that building type. Retreat with a Potion of Invulnerability, heal up at the fountain, buy a new potion, and then wait for Metamorphosis cooldown. As this happens, Malfurion builds a progressively larger defense to hold off the attacks against him. After repeating this process about 15 times, Red has run out of meaningful buildings, and Illidan, once again, has single-handedly saved the Night Elves from certain destruction and gets no thanks for it. Oh, and before winning, remember to pick up those mana stones on the ground. They're going to be useful later.